Welcome to the finals of the Uplink Trillion Trees Challenge. In this session, we will hear from six finalists about their solutions to how we can scale and accelerate the conservation and restoration of our forests. This session is a collaboration between Uplink, the World Economic Forum's digital platform to crowdsource innovative solutions to the sustainable development goals, and OneT.org, the Trillion Trees platform, which was set up to connect, empower, and serve a global community to conserve, restore, and grow a trillion trees over the next decade. Uplink, since its founding, since its launch with founding partners Salesforce and Deloitte, has received more than 500 submissions across a series of challenges on oceans, on COVID, and of course, trillion trees, which is what we will be focusing on today. And there are already 4,000 active entrepreneurs, change makers, experts, and investors on the platform looking on how to connect and scale some of these solutions to our most intractable challenges and roadblocks. So I am delighted to present this session to you today where, we'll, where we will hear from some of these amazing entrepreneurs. We have received over 250 submissions um, to the Trillion Trees Challenge. We have narrowed it down to a cohort of 20 and 12 semi-finalists and the six finalists that you will hear from today are the ones that will pitch their solutions. And today we will ask our panel to come down to narrow to the three winners. So I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. Um, first of all, Inger Anderson, Director General of the United Nations Environment Programme. Hindu Ibrahim, President of the Association for Indigenous Women and Peoples of Chad. Suzanne DiBianca, Chief Impact Officer and Executive Vice President of Corporate Relations for Salesforce. Rod Taylor, the Global Director of Forests at the World Resources Institute. Chineyenwa Okoro Onu, Founder and Managing Director of Waste or Create Hub and one of our global shapers. Bruno Sanchez Andrade Nuno, Principal Scientist, AI for the Earth at Microsoft, and Michael Renner, Managing Partner at Deloitte. Our panel of judges will be hearing from the finalists, and the way this session will run is that we will first hear some introductory remarks from Inger Anderson and Hindu Ibrahim, and afterwards, each of the finalists whom I will present in a moment will have five minutes to present their solution followed by five minutes question and answers from the judging panel, um, which will really be those 10 minutes that they have to pitch their solution and to give um, an insight into the amazing work that they have been doing across the different aspects of the Trillion Trees Challenge. We have a very broad variety of solutions um, because we wanted to, to bring in the diversity as the challenge asked for submissions across the different areas of scaling. Um, uh, solutions to, to accelerate uh, forest restoration and conservation, mass mobilization, technology for trees, greening our cities and establishing the forest economy. So a very wide variety of submissions, um, each of them amazing in their own right. Throughout this session, we welcome your participation. And the way we will do that is that we will welcome your questions through Slido. So as you can see on your screen, you can go to slido.com or scan the QR code that is on the right of your screen at the moment, uh, which will take you to the website. And by entering the event code SDIS and selecting the room Uplink Trillion Trees Challenge, you will be able to ask your questions. And more importantly, you will also be able to vote for our People's Choice Award once you have heard from each of the five, uh, six finalists. And the three winners, along with the People's Choice Award, will be announced at the closing session of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit on Thursday, 24th September at 2 p.m. European time. So I am now uh, delighted to turn to our first speaker, Inger Anderson. Thank you for joining us. Wanti.org was set up to support the UN Decade for Ecosystems Restoration. And I would like to, to welcome you and ask you to tell us a little bit more about the UN Decade and the central role of ecopreneurship, innovation, and what is often called the restoration generation and helping us to achieve the goals of the decade. Inger. 
Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, a great, huge thanks to both the WEF, to Uplink, to OneTrillionTree.org uh, for really pushing this uh, idea and this imperative and huge congratulations to all the entries. There's just so much innovation in there and we are so impressed by, I think the judges will have an impossible task ahead of them, but that will be for others to worry about. Um, now, first of all, just to say, look, we are in a crisis, globally speaking. We are losing our nature, we're losing our ecosystems, we are losing, and in so doing, we're losing species, but we're also losing the very regulation that, the, that, that nature provides, of weather, of rainfall, of fertility, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this really matters. And um, the twin sister to the IPCC, the IPES, which deals with the science of ecosystems and species and biodiversity has come out with some very important data. Data that tells us that we are really eroding the nature upon which all life is based. We've in interfered with or impacted about 77% of the total land surface of the earth. It bears thinking about. So 77% of the land surface, we've, we've, we've sort of, in we've, we've, done something to it. Now that has been good, it has gotten us food, it has gotten us cities, it has gotten us infrastructure, all good. But we can't continue to do this and assume that all these other things will continue happening. So, um, and, and of course, we know very well that nature is critical when it comes uh, to, and ecosystems are critical uh, when it comes to uh, carbon storage, to weather patterns, to pollinators, uh, to uh, overall soil fertility and obviously to species as we know it. So as we are seeing this loss of fertility, as we are seeing the creation of degraded lands, uh, the UN has decided, uh, thanks to our member states, that this next decade shall be the decade for restoration. And so having a total uh, amount of, of these submissions really showing that young people, that eco, uh, I have a hard time getting that word, but entrepreneurs in the eco sphere are willing and ready to, to roll this out and to show initiative. This is massive. The, just last week, we issued the Global Biodiversity Outlook, and that is um, the outlook where we said, so how's nature doing? And unfortunately, the report card that we are getting as a humanity is a, a fail. We set in 2010 some targets that were set in a Japanese city called Aichi uh, Prefecture, so therefore they're referred to as the Aichi targets. And we are failing across all 20 of these targets. That's not good enough. And as we're heading into COP15 of biodiversity, at which point we will set new targets for the next decade and into 2050, it becomes critical. And here restoration can become key, right? We've fragmented, exhausted, extracted, cut down so much of nature. So let's think about that. Let's see how we can stretch. Now, there is some good news. Uh, 91 countries have signed up for integrating nature into how they look upon their national wealth, if you like, how they account for how wealthy they are. And that's critical because as uh, Professor Pathada Skupta says, nature is an asset. It's an asset class that we need to consider as part of our wealth. Not that we're going around putting dollar signs on trees, but that we have an understanding that without nature, frankly, the rest is sort of immaterial because it only produces the air we breathe, the food, water we drink, the food we eat, the houses we live in, the clothes we wear. It's kind of basic stuff. And so this ecosystem restoration decade, it calls specifically that we should prevent, halt and reverse the degradation of ecosystem, prevent, halt and reverse. So that's what we are about we have had an extent, extensive consultation on how to roll out the decade. There's been massive amount of young people who are really engaged and we're very, very grateful for that with our partners in uh, food and agriculture organization, FAO and UNEP. We were asked by the United Nations to be the sort of um, custodians or the primary movers for for this decade, but we are wanting everyone to crowd in. That is what really matters here. And so this decade will kick off uh, in the beginning of next year. And we're really looking to 
every single person, every single company, every single community, uh, taking and of course every single country and government taking a proactive role here and youth organizations have been critical and will continue to be critical um, the UN's major group on children and youth have been really instrumental for us but we look at everyone uh, to come in and private sector and this is my final point Nicole private sector is critical uh, and this is where the WEF has such a beautiful bridge because you're combining it all in this particular uh, uh, initiative. We know that the private sector right now has a, a significant part of the solution. After all, private sector manages agriculture, private sector manages forestry, private sector manages fishery, private sector manages infrastructure. So be part of the solution. And what, and obviously, try to find ways that the financial sector will begin to not invest in gray and dirty um, futures, but invest in green and lush futures. And, and that also means ensuring that the kind of subsidies that are going into gray and dirty be, be shifted out. Today, we're talking about uh, millions and trillions of dollars that are going into un sustainable subsidies, whether it be on the energy side or whether it be on the agriculture side. Look at that. And right now with $15 billion going into from our public monies into stimulus, this will not happen again in the post pandemic uh, setting. We're trying to get the economies back. This stimulus package across the world has to have that green reset. And that green reset needs to be part, uh, restoration needs to be part of that green reset. So that's what it's all about. These fantastic young people who have put in uh, these many, many proposals, uh, you will have a headache finding out who's going to be the very best. Uh, but I think each and every person who's, uh, who has put in for some of these uh, ideas actually is part of the solution. And from our side at UNEP, we wish you all the very best of luck. And we look forward to working with you, uh, both uh, with Uplink, as well as obviously with the Trillion Tree Channel Challenge, as well as with the WEF in the, in the months and years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Inger. And, and as you very rightly say, uh, all of us need to participate uh, in this, this UN decade and in the process of restoration. And let me turn to you, Hindu. With your experience of working with indigenous peoples and, and local communities, how can we make sure that the indigenous people local communities perspective is included and is, um, you know, goes hand in hand with the types of innovations that we are going to hear about today? Hindu, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be with all of you. Then it's uh, hard to talk after Inga. Inga, so nice to see you and thanks for the leadership. So uh, I'm firstly really honored to be in this panel of uh, judges for this final round of the trillion three competitions. And we all believe that you are already a winners because your time dedicated to collaborate in achieve all the solutions to this global goal. So congratulations to all of you. We, winning one, maybe it's something, but all of you are doing incredible work that helping all of us. Uh, the world estimate more than 37% of the cost effect of emission reduction that come from the uh, nature-based solutions. And as coming from an indigenous communities, for me, nature-based solution, it is our way of life. And we know already the most vulnerable communities know how to protect this nature in the natural way for a long time. And as I am representing indigenous peoples and one of the uh, sustainable development gold uh, advocate and also the WEF champion for nature, my message for all of you is, we must rebuild our relationship with nature for the survival of the peoples and our planet. And that is all about it. And that is also all about the competition that we are having. It is about peoples. It is about the indigenous peoples in the local communities. Indigenous people that save more than 80% of the world biodiversity, but who found themselves 
in front line also of the climate change and biodiversity loss. So all the solutions coming from the technology innovations need to respond to the needs of those communities. It's need also to serve those communities and they cannot be only a beneficiaries. They must be a partners on those innovations. They must build it together because we are talking about sustainability. And this is the luck who took us in this pathway of climate change and loss of biodiversity. But if they are a partners, I think they will take it for long. And uh, Inga said also because of the COVID we are in this uh, pathway, maybe we are lucky to meet virtually. But imagine for the community who do not have access to the electricity and we can't talk about the internet, so they can't meet. But they are experts in the field where we talk about the land restoration, ecosystem restoration, when we talk about tree planting, when we talk about saving the remaining tropical forests that we have. They are more expert than all of us that meeting virtually, even they do not have access to this technology. So why not we can have a proper technology that can help those peoples who putting the food in our tables to help us restore the ecosystem that we do have. So this is all about what we are doing. So the most uh, vulnerable and poor peoples in these rural areas, they deserve this rebuilding better and rebuilding green to respond to them, to give them all what they need and to replant this a trillion trees because we cannot get one trees overnight. We can get it with our relationship over years. And that's what indigenous peoples and local communities know. So we need everyone in each from governments, private sector, of course, indigenous peoples, local communities, civil society to come together. There is no vaccine for climate change. We cannot wear a mask. We cannot build the world but we can fight it together if we all engage. And I'm so excited to hear from each of you experience and presentations. And as I said, you are already a winners and you are giving us a tough job if we need to choose one among you. But I believe that you are all a winner and I will be very happy to follow up with all of you. You are changing the life of my peoples and of many other indigenous communities that you do not know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hindu. And, and as, as we will hear very soon, um, I think Uplink is doing a great job in precisely bringing together some of these perspectives from across the world and, and how we can bridge uh, the technology and, and you know, AI with traditional knowledge and local communities on the ground. So without further ado, I would like to turn to the pitching part of this session. And I would like to introduce our finalists. We will start with Simon Husson from the Borneo Nature Foundation. Second will be Adam Philby, Drendra Systems. Um, then Mike Hans from Inga Foundation. Fourth, we have Diego Sanz and Lisa Walker from Reforestem and Ecosphere Plus. Then John Leary, Trees for the Future, and David Ezra J from Greenstand. So we will start now with our first finalist, Simon Hassan from the Borneo Nature Foundation. Simon, over to you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, um, yeah, my name is Simon Hassan, and I am the founder and director of the Borneo Nature Foundation. And it's a great honor to be here, and it's my pleasure to present our project to you today. Let me start by introducing BNF to you. We are an Indonesian NGO with our headquarters in Kalimantan on the island of Borneo, where we work with governments, communities and other stakeholders to promote sustainable development and to protect some of the last great rainforests in the world. We started life 21 years ago as a small research project, collecting biodiversity data and providing recommendations that helped lead to the designation of the Sabangau National Park. And this is still the location of our main program. So Bangau is the largest lowland forest remaining in Borneo. It's a dense flooded swamp forest with an amazing array of biodiversity. And the forest stands on top of a bed of peat up to 15 meters thick. Over 90% of the carbon in the ecosystem is locked into this peat where it's been accumulating for 20,000 years. Unfortunately, much of this peatland has been drained and degraded by human activity, which causes the peat to dry out and to become highly flammable. Climate change causes frequent droughts, and in 2015, fires erupted in the forest near to our long-term research camp. And these quickly spread and burned along a two-kilometer front. And although we sent 100 people out to fight the fires day and night, 
including our entire research team. It only took the arrival of the rains to finally put it out. And over the course of a single month, we came close to losing everything that we'd been working for for two decades. So it was a disaster from our perspective, but of course the overall impact was much greater. Huge areas of forest and their biodiversity were lost and the health impacts for local people were incredibly serious. In 2015, children in Kalimantan were wearing masks to school long before we'd ever heard of COVID-19. And the amount of carbon released was massive with a daily emissions rate greater than the EU's burning of forest fuels, which led to one of the highest recorded annual increases in atmospheric CO2. Now, for us in BNF, this was a huge wake up call. This was a realization that if we were to achieve lasting impact, we had to diversify and to scale up everything we were doing. We work at the grassroots level, developing community-led solutions to tackle both the fires and the causes of fire. So we established, trained and equipped three new community firefighting teams. And when the fires returned in 2019, these guys were right on the front line, succeeding in stopping all of them entering the forest. We encouraged changes in behavior from working with farmers to develop peat-friendly agriculture, to teaching young generations. And we worked to restore the peatland, blocking drainage channels to rewet the peat and by reforesting burnt areas. Now, reforestation, which is our main topic today, of course, is critical, it's critical in burnt peatlands. One characteristic of burnt peatland is that, is that it burns over and over again. It spreads out and burns even more forest. So reforesting the burnt area doesn't only help rebuild that forest, but it protects the surrounding forest as well. But of course, reforesting burnt peatland is hard. If you were to log a peat swamp forest, it will generally grow back naturally. But once the top layer of peat has burnt away, the nutrient layer and seed bank are lost, and the conditions are so harsh that a climax vegetation of grasses and ferns grows instead. So we've spent a long time undertaking research on how to restore burnt peatlands, discovering which native species will grow here, and learning from other organizations attempting the same in Kalimantan. So in 2018, we started our community nursery project in order to provide the seedlings to enable us to plant at scale. It's a simple concept. We give young seedlings to community groups, which they grow on their land. We train them to be expert nursery managers, give them resources, and then buy the seedlings back when they're ready to plant. And then we protect and we monitor them for the long term. In this way, the community gain additional income and they're involved in all stages of the process. The communities themselves helped to develop the strategy with us and their ownership of the project and the crossover with the firefighting teams motivates them to protect their trees. We're working with women's groups to make organic bags that improve planting success. And as the project grows, we'll help them develop permaculture projects so they can use the nurseries for their own long-term benefit. And of course, there are numerous benefits for conservation. So today we've got seven nurseries up and running with 40 people working in them and we planted the first 50,000 seedlings earlier this year. It's a simple project, it's not expensive on a per tree basis, and has clear upscaling and, and potential and co-benefits. Now, we're still near the start of our journey. So we set ourselves an initial target of 1 million trees planted by 2025. We want to partner with other local organizations to develop and spread this initiative across Kalimantan. Now, to achieve this, we need to complement our existing funding base by accessing new sources of funding from partnerships with the private sector to exploring the potential of carbon-based financing and making that work for all tropical peatlands. Now, if funding was to become unlimited, beyond that, our challenge is to develop our own institutional capacity. We've grown substantially since 2015, and we have a fantastic team of 70 people working on our projects in Kalimantan, but, we'll, but we will need to increase the size of our teams, add experience, and provide training opportunities. And hand in hand with this, is increasing our expertise to address the most difficult challenges, such as reforesting the most remote and hard to reach areas, and making sure that this project is integrated as part of a regional effort to deal with the peatland fire crisis in Kalimantan, and to make sure that our projects are having a real long lasting impact on the ground. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to finish with two images there. Um, the orangutan was the reason that I went to Borneo in the first place. Um, but it's the people of Kalimantan that are the reason that I've stayed and want to help future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. So who from our judges would like to ask Simon the first question? Yes, uh, Rod Taylor. 
Thanks, Simon. Um, great presentation. Um, I'm interested to know what other threats there are to Subunga, what other forms of encroachment are there mining, is, is there illegal logging, and how your uh, project can re re address those threats. Over. Yes, thank you, Rod. Um, the area before it became a national park in 2004 was a logged forest and it suffered heavily from illegal logging at the turn of the century. Um, and one of the first conservation efforts we put in place was dealing with illegal logging, helping support community patrol teams to stop it and managed to successfully stop that um, soon after the start of the national park. Yes, there are encroachment issues on the edge. Um, the drainage of the peat is important, not only because it, it helps promote the fires, but also it, um, it does cause peat subsidence. And so all of these issues are being addressed, um, being addressed in sort of integrated fashion to rewet the peat and to work with farmers and stuff, and ultimately to support the national park management and helping them uh, protect the, um, the entire area. Thanks. Yes, Michael. Hi, um, what is the, uh, I think you mentioned this, the total addressable area to, to be restored in Borneo in, and in Indonesia? I think you said 2 million hectares, no? There's 2 million hectares of peatland burnt, yes. Um, now, it's a huge area of peat and obviously that requires, you know, that requires intervention, interventions at, at, at every level from the government down and from grassroots up. Uh, much of this area is under smallholder management and then um, we need to work with the uh, farmers to promote peat friendly management um, and to actually find ways that we can actually grow. You know, not all the, some of the peat is forest and protected. Some of the peat is in agriculture areas. And the most important thing with the peat is to be growing on it and is to be, um, is to continue having uh, biomass growing on top and maintaining the peat because so much of it is, is a wasteland. It's degrading. It's burning, of course. Um, and so, yes, I mean, and then within the national park, obviously the area to reforest is smaller, um, but the but the total challenge is is of course huge, right? And and what you what you've learned um, about restoring and preserving peat, how generalizable do you see that being to other areas in the world? I mean, I don't know enough to say this with any confidence, but I imagine there must be something similar elsewhere, even up to and including um, boreal peat, for example. Do you think you've learned anything that would be helpful in very different ecologies? Of course, and I mean, so peatlands are. A particularly difficult ecosystem to restore because you have this interface between the vegetation on top and the peat underneath and you get rid of one and it, and it impacts the other. Um, we're learning a lot from peatland scientists that work in, uh, in, our, in arboreal peatlands um, and through International Peat Society and other organizations like that. There's a lot of discussion on, on them how to restore, how to uh, re-wet these um, peatlands. Um, these tropical peatlands is probably the largest scale that you can look at for this, but obviously the reforestation, the re-wetting, and preventing future fires will go hand in hand. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I think we may have time for a very brief last question, 30 seconds Hindu. I think you had one more question for Simon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just quickly, Simon, uh, I know that there are indigenous communities and also a local displaced peoples that resettle in uh, Kalimanta. So are you working with uh, both of them or just one? And if both of them, uh, may you name the organization, please? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's organizations like, um, like Care and Wetlands International and others that work with these communities. And, uh, and we also work with obviously with these communities in our area as well. There's the indigenous communities that, um, that are predominantly fishing based communities and they rely on the peats and forests for a huge number of, uh, of natural resource of uh, natural resources and natural benefits. For example, you know, fish in the young stage of their life have their, um, their early life stages within the peat swamp itself. There's also many of these communities that have moved to Indonesia, were, uh, that have moved to Kalimantan, were actually moved to these peatland areas with the idea to farm it. And in the late 90s, there was a disastrous agricultural project that cleared huge areas of peat to, to give to communities to farm. And of course, that farm intended to fail. It's very difficult to, to do agriculture there. So these are communities that we're helping to work with for peat friendly agriculture and helping to promote different ways of, of, of growing crops, different forms of permaculture and fisheries to help them there. Thank you, Simon. We have more questions from the audience, but we unfortunately have to move on to our next uh, finalist, Adam Philby, who will be presenting for Dendra Systems. Adam, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you. When we founded Dendra Systems over six years ago, carbon was just below 400 parts per million, 
As of July this year, it was at 414. And despite all the efforts to curtail, it's still climbing. With a net loss of over 6 billion trees a year, it's not just carbon though, we are facing an unprecedented loss of biodiversity. When we look at the challenge, there are many ways to attack it. The list of innovative solutions is long. We can restore, we can sequester, we can reduce and replace. At Dendra, we've chosen to focus on restoration and sequestration. Our mission to tackle this challenge is to enable scalable restoration for our complex and very importantly, our biodiverse natural world. The market drivers for ecosystem restoration are primarily biodiversity and carbon. Biodiversity restoration is already well established and regulated within the resources market and is starting to drive activities globally. We've completed over 38 projects to date across 11 countries in the last few years, working with some of the world's largest resource companies. The carbon market is growing, but to reach its full potential as a vehicle for restoration investment, it requires trust, scale, and optimization. Dendro have developed and deployed an end-to-end -end system designed to help biodiverse ecosystems survive and thrive. Using our own aerial-based imaging platform, we collect, process, and manage enormous data sets representing intimate ecosystem detail. These data sets offer significant improvements over traditional survey methods, such as those that use ground-based transects and rely on estimates. We're, not only, we're also not only constrained by the limitations of satellite-based data sets, which sacrifice the detail needed to manage biodiverse environments, especially in years zero to 10, when early intervention is key to improving outcomes. The complexity of modeling these environments relies on significant but yet scalable compute resources. Developed over the last six years, our AI-driven engine can now provide insight into ecosystem condition, the health of flora and fauna species, and the risk posed by invasive species and landform instability. These detailed insights all facilitate targeted action, improved outcomes, and increased accountability. Dendra's platform enables end-to-end -end transparency and stakeholder engagement from landholders to investors via a single scalable platform. At Dendra, we've taken biodiversity analytics to a whole new level. We're able to analyze every inch of soil and every plant down to a blade of grass. We can achieve this at scale whilst maintaining accuracy. The insights produced can be used to efficiently mobilize landowners, portfolio managers, and communities to both influence and then to also audit the outcomes. We're able to see and share data on land in a way that has never been possible before. Whether you're monitoring tree species, tracking growth, or viewing accurate carbon sequestration data, both at the per plant or ecosystem level, data is easily accessed. It's possible to monitor the health of ecosystems by tracking the presence of animals that have made it their home or to identify invasive species that need to be removed. These insights and the subsequent action they enable lead to improved outcomes and through transparency and accountability, facilitate the trust needed for large scale investment in restoration projects. We're ecology driven in everything we do. We don't engage in single species planting projects that would be building back a fragile environment. Our aerial seeding platform that we've developed has the ability to deliver over 50 different species at one time. To meet the trillion trees challenge, we need to deliver scale. Drone and AI based solutions are a way to achieve this, but are often seen as replacements for people and community engagement. When looking at restorations, couldn't be further from the truth. When we look at the size of the problem, Dendra's solution both complements and scales community driven restoration projects. Better survey methods mean that we're no longer relying on estimates. Better data means better analytics, which in turn leads to improved decision-making and ultimately better outcomes. With investment de-risk, larger projects can be undertaken, which increases the requirement for jobs in long-term land stewardship. For our platform, we want to empower and enable landowners and communities to make better decisions for their land, to direct resources to where they're most needed, and to increase the scale of what's achievable with what are in some cases very limited resources. Planting trees requires more than dropping seeds. 30% of land restoration is appropriate for direct seeding and our aerial seeding platform is used where appropriate. We can analyze restoration from direct seeding, hand planting and manage natural regeneration and are able to provide insights to improve outcomes no matter what method is used. Aerial seeding can be used to de-risk, improve safety and facilitate larger projects, which again in turn leads to the need for increased community engagement and jobs. We're a global team of ecologists, engineers, data scientists, and drone operators who've come together to address this challenge. Like the ecosystems we support, we're growing. So please join our team or the journey by investing in restoration, sequestration, reducing, and replacing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who would like to ask the first question to Simon? Um, maybe one of the judges we haven't heard from yet. 
Yes, Suzanne. Hi, thank you. Um, a question for you around cost. Can you talk a little bit about the average cost, what you've seen over um, the, the last uh, number of years that you've been running and, and how you kind of anticipating bringing costs down over time? Yeah, so obviously the, um, the cost of carbon varies on a project by project basis, but typically what we've seen because of the operational intelligence that we can drive, we bring around, including our costs, we bring the overall cost of carbon down by about 10% on a per project basis. It's what we've seen consistently. Thank you, Simon. Another question. Anyone else from the panel who has another question? Bruno, do you have a question for Simon? Yeah, I, I'd love to know more about the relations with the communities. Like, it's great that you, you can do a lot of remote sensing and even with aerial drones to seed the plants, but then, for example, to remove the invasive species and to, to, to get to see what you cannot see from above, I'd love to know how you engage with the local communities, not only as part of the, of the sensors or in a way to measure things, but also to act and the benefits for them, uh, for example, economically. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Max Simon. So, the community, um, or the landowner engagement is absolutely key. And to, first of all, because we can, we can survey the land using drones, there has to be trust in our organization to do that. Um, but once we've actually completed the seeding activities, it's where the, the hard work really starts. Um, we can provide obviously a huge amount of data, uh, insights and analytics that can be used on the ground to make better decisions. But it's really for that local community to be empowered with that data um, to make decisions around the best use of that land and to also preserve the planting. Um, as probably many people are aware, the, the early years um, in, re in restoration activities are key in terms of ensuring long-term success to prevent that weed mitigation, um, to prevent cattle and other grazing animals from destroying the, uh, the seeds or, or the seeding there. So we typically, um, if we're not working on a commercial um, restoration project, uh, we'd be working very closely with NGOs who understand the, the local community, the local environment, and all of the, and be able to bring the local stakeholders together. And one of the key um, benefits or one of the values of our solution is to provide a common platform with that information um, transparently available for all of those different stakeholders to see, view, and monitor, and, and track the, uh, the, the project over time. Um, so it's not we turn up in year one and we do our work, it's you know, a 10 year engagement with you know, it, the great transparency that that enables for all stakeholders. Thank you, Simon. And one last question uh, from the audience, which is about applicability across different types of landscapes. So how well does Dendra work in um, high tree and cloud cover tropical landscapes? Yeah, so there's, um, there's certain use cases where we would perform seeding um, and typically um, that would not necessarily be in those environments where we would conduct more monitoring based um, activities for established forest areas. Um, we've worked across dry lands, we've worked in wetlands, and we believe that they're around 30% of um, the degraded land is suitable for, um, for direct seeding by drone. But um, we believe that we can monitor and, and have um, across a number of different environments, the different ecosystems in there. So there is a, um, it's not applicable in terms of the, the drone operations for every single environment, but we view it as a complementary activity to support on the ground restoration work. Great, thank you very much, Adam. Sorry for calling you Simon. Um, so we are now going to move to our third finalist, uh, Mike Hands uh, from Inga Foundation. Mike, over to you. Hello, I'm, I'm Mike Hands. Uh, I'm a tropical forest ecologist and uh, I've for many years worked uh, for the University of Cambridge as a researcher but based in Central America uh, researching the ecology of slash and burn agriculture and of course the ecology of any possible alternative. Here you see the problem, uh, it's estimated that there are some 250 to 300 million families around the tropics as a whole, not just rainforest, who are burning vegetation in order to subsist. It's completely unsustainable and as far as we can calculate it's, it's firing about 2 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere annually. We have a solution. Uh, it is using nitrogen fixing trees uh, supplemented by minerals in the worst of soils. We can restore the soil to fertility. We can restore food security 
And then uh, because we take the pressure of the land of further slash and burn, uh, the, the remaining land of this, in this case, a, a theoretical eight hectare family holding can be reforested with various other forms of agroforestry. We've got four techniques, there are many more, and uh, they are just not just restoring the, uh, the family holding, but when we've got 300 people concentrated in two areas, they are restoring the landscape. Uh, the, we start with nitrogen fixing trees going into, the, into these very degraded site, being slashed and burnt for over a hundred years. And they're planting them in hedgerows with four meters between the hedgerows. This is a way of stabilizing the slope as well. They'll grow quickly. This is a, a, a sister organization in Mexico. We train them to do it. The, the, the Inga have begun to uh, recapture the site from the invasive grasses. And after up to about two years, the Inga will have completely eliminated the grass by shading and the soil beneath the canopy. Next, please, Gianluca. The soil will be ready for, for planting. That's natural little fall. You can see there we use no herbicides. That's wiped out two species of invasive grass. Uh, next one, please. This is the key to why Inga alley cropping works. It's a complete innovation to the original concept of alley cropping, which was developed in Africa and is widely regarded to as failed. The trees, the Inga are pruned at roughly five feet in height. The branches and stems are removed as one of the favorite uh, domestic firewoods and very valuable indeed. But the main feature is that the foliage has been stripped and is now mulched onto the soil surface. Now it will decompose slowly, and that's a deliberate choice of Inga, uh, in order to protect the soil from torrential rain and from insulation, baking in intense sunshine. Uh, the nutrients will become available for the next crop, but the key to this one is that that's, that physical protection allows the fine roots of the cropping system to penetrate the very surface soils where the nutrients are created. You can see on the right here, that's our demonstration farm. We've trained many people. It's being replicated in 15 other countries now. This is what they see when they come. The maize will be taken off, the trees will recover, and the following year will, uh, the whole process could be repeated. Uh, the second component of the four component model is cash cropping, in this case, pepper, interplanted with turmeric, they're bio, botanically unrelated, uh, and that's a very, very productive, profitable uh, scheme for the, uh, for the family, it can transform the family income. The third component is very different arrangement. These are fruit trees associated with Inga as their only source of nitrogen. In this case, it's cacao developing beneath the shade, which is what cacao likes, uh, but there are other configurations. Uh, the fourth component of the model is reforestation. Uh, you can see on the right, this is actually some land that we bought next to the demonstration farm. It's now our arboretum for rare and threatened species. It's been planted here, this is three years ago, uh, with Inga about six meters apart, and they will be interplanted with some valuable or endangered uh, tropical tree species as seed, seed sources for the future and underplanted with cacao. This is the same plot, the same slope uh, three years later, taken earlier this year. It looks like a forest. It's actually an agroforest. The, the timbers will, species will start to push through. The cacao will develop, will control the shade by lopping branches occasionally for the cacao. Now at landscape scale, we, we, we uh, this is what the system looks like. Our strategy has been to concentrate uh, fairly small resources in two areas so that we can convince big decision makers that where you restore uh, a family holding and there are 300 of them, you've begun to restore the entire landscape. Here's a summary of what has been achieved since 2012, uh, hundreds of families and hundreds of thousands of tons CO2 sequestered and we've achieved it 
uh, whilst positively addressing 11 of the 17 United Nations SDGs. And the result is we are now inundated with hundreds of families who've seen their neighbors' uh, production systems survive the worst El Nino effects of the past uh, four or five years. It's the worst ever recorded. And they now see, they're completely convinced that the tree system, the Ingus system will work for them. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Mike. Who would like to ask the first question to Mike from our panel? Any questions? Yes, Bruno. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's uh, a fantastic work. It, it sounds great. What is your, your biggest barrier for growth? Oh, core funding for Inga Foundation. Um, of course, at present, I mean, the, the, team, the team is working in the field in, in Honduras, but the lockdown there is very severe. It's one of the worst I, I, I know of. And um, that's, a, that's a sort of short term. But for us, core funding, uh, we've already been selected by four government ministries uh, as a, an, an NGO of great interest. And they, they're talking about our training their technicians. We've trained already uh, a couple of dozen from the Ministry of Environment. And what we see is that the demonstration farm, it's, it's now 12 hectares, um, is probably going to become a training center more than anything. And we may possibly ease off the extension work that's occupied the past uh, eight years. Thank you. We had one more question from Suzanne first, I think. Yeah, the judges uh, always take the same question I'm gonna ask right before I ask it. So, uh, but I'll just add one more in, which is around, um, uh, you know, what, what have you found in terms of maintenance um, is sort of over time and anything that you uh, learned that you didn't know about the ecosystems that sort of come in afterwards? Okay, that's a fabulous pair of questions. I'm gonna start with the last bit. Um, what I was not able to say is um, after the Cambridge projects in, in Costa Rica, what emerged from seven years of trials of subsistence cropping systems was the only system that was sustainable was alley cropping with Inga species, but supplemented by rock phosphate. There'd been so much confusion in the literature about do forests need rock phosphate, uh, phosphate or not? And everybody had been experimenting with these soluble fertilizer forms, which fail because they leach in those soils. We used rock phosphate and we got an immediate response. It was still there seven years later. That's part of the question um, about maintenance. So, you, you have to supplement any sustainable system, including this one, with rock phosphate, nothing else, rock phosphate. What we then discovered in Honduras that some of the soils are so degraded over such a long period of time. They're called, the, the farmers call them esteril, they're sterile. They say won't grow anything except invasive grass. And we discovered that the Inga and phosphate con, uh, combination alone isn't enough. Uh, we, but we did apply something I'd tried in the Cambridge project, which is dolomite and KMAG, sulfates of magnesium, potassium. And that mixture had an absolutely miraculous effect on the growth of the trees, little shrinking trees that were suffering, uh, leapt up from a meter and a quarter up to four meters in two and a half months. It was astonishing. And it, it restored the fertility of that plot. We then learned from the farmers that they it was a hundred years ago that they were first slashed and burnt. Mike, thank you very much. I'm sorry that we can't um, uh, hear more about it because it's absolutely fascinating. But uh, in the interest of time, we will have to move to our next um, finalists, which are Diego Sanz and Lisa Walker from Reforest Them and Ecosphere. I think, Lisa, you will be starting. So over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Nicole. Yes, hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Walker, CEO of Ecosphere Plus. And I'm very happy to be presenting jointly today with Diego Sanz, CEO of Reforestum. Thank you very much to the forum, Uplink and Trillion Trees for hosting us. The carbon market should be the biggest market in the world. 
there's a carbon consequence to every decision we make every day, whether that's buying a product, getting on a plane, sending an email, etc. EcoSurplus and Reforestum launched a partnership earlier this year, bringing together our complementary skills as we have a shared vision that we can harness the potential of the carbon market to accelerate ca action for nature. At EcoSphere Plus, we're a part of an impact investment platform financing large scale natural climate solutions or NCS projects. And Reforestum brings leading digital technology and local reforestation capabilities. Together, we can provide an end to end solution for corporates and their customers, addressing the barriers to scaling climate finance for nature. And we're on a mission to mobilize widespread action by embedding NCS in transactions across the value chain and across sectors. We've already achieved a lot, 2 billion trees and over 2 million hectares protected globally, much of that in high conservation value habitat, 30 million tons of carbon emissions reductions, and we've provided solutions to more than 40 corporate clients. And the bit we're really excited about, through our corporate clients, tens of millions of customers have already been offered carbon pricing for nature at the point of sale. In the next five years together, we can really scale. We're targeting 5 billion trees and 10 million hectares globally, and that includes thousands of hectares of reforestation projects in Europe, 70 million tons of carbon reductions, and we believe we can reach over a billion consumers through corporate partnerships and millions of individuals. So now over to Jago, who will tell you how. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Diego Sanz. I'm the CEO and founder here at the Reforestum. Uh, our partnership with Ecosphere Plus brings to life an end-to-end -end solution, uh, starting with the corporates and their net zero targets, as well as the individual consumers pushing them to action. Uh, we engage those through our B2B2C model, and the first way in which we engage our customers of different kinds is by user interfaces, going all the way from enterprise solutions to our easy-to-integrate APIs, point of search plugins, both for e-commerce and retail, as well as individual profiles. Um, we also add a layer of trust and transparency powered by AI and remote sensing, which results in an integrated monitoring, reporting, and verification solution, our MRV, that enables users to bring to life the carbon credits and forest source that they are purchasing. And it helps to build a digital community around the projects. Last but not least, these projects are really what our partnership brings to life in the best way. Not just around trees, but around forests, their communities, and the jobs that they support, both at a very large scale through Ecosphere Living Portfolio worldwide, as well as a more local scale through our deforestation capabilities in Spain and soon on other European countries. Uh, now, I would like to show you how the platform works uh, behind the scenes. First, uh, the project is financed uh, by one of our clients or funds. Second, uh, we divide the area in for the source that contains certified carbon credits. Uh, this system enables greater traceability and is designed to build trust and transparency in a way that the general public should clearly understand how remote monitoring and carbon certifications work, rather than reinventing a new certification mechanism. Uh, third, our core engine keeps track of its transaction, such as for the source, Insurances or credit retirement through a public registry that serves as the foundation of a digital community and that helps to showcase to the world the efforts of corporates and citizens in a way that is more transparent, highlights the project environmental value, and connects every stakeholder with the forests and communities behind them. In regards to our forest this year, uh, we saw Adidas, our first major corporate partner, integrating our API and committing to plant a corporate forest in the coming months. Uh, joined Microsoft on two of their programs, uh, released our first e-commerce plugin very recently, and finally, we are going to launch a pi uh, first prototype of the MRV by uh, the end of the year. Uh, now over to you, Lisa. Thanks. Yeah, L'Oreal is a great example of how things can scale and how we can find solutions right across the value chain. So Ecosphere Plus has been partnering with them on insetting since 2019 on peatland restoration in Sumatra to balance their own carbon impact. This year, L'Oreal launched a 50 million euro fund to regenerate nature, which will be managed by Morova, which are the investors behind Ecosphere Plus. And now Reforestum will be part of L'Oreal's startup program as winner of the Tech for Good competition with the potential to bring solutions to consumers. So, We'll end by saying achieving the goal of one trillion trees requires a systemic reset and a reset of our relationship with nature. 
We believe we can enable this through our end-to-end -end solution to deliver a system-wide shift in behavior and unlock the positive potential of climate finance. Just imagine one cent added to every financial card transaction in a year could keep 370 billion trees standing or a third of our goal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn now to the judges who would like to ask the first question. Yes, Chine Yenwa. Uh, I think you have to unmute yourself. Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Um, great presentation, Lisa. I just have a question. How do you find the companies um, that you connect? And also, what criteria do you use to identify what unique projects to associate them with? Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, as Diego said, we find that a lot of our clients are, are those corporates that are, I think, leaders in their field. They're, they're wanting to commit to or they've already committed to a net zero transition pathway and they see this as a way to um, you know really obviously um, deliver emissions reductions whilst they are on that transition so they very much sort of go hand in hand across that pathway um, and secondly as a you know we have a really sort of strict um, environmental social governance or ESG um, set of principles that, that apply to all the projects that we invest in and we also set um, key performance indicators across a whole range of different um, of different areas, which which means we can really, um, you know, target high performing projects and make sure that we're improving the governance and managing them well. And that includes, you know, the IFC performance standards, FPIC and um, yeah, lots of other best practice standards. Thank you, Lisa. One more question from the panel. Yes, uh, Michael. Hi, um, uh, how do you use the monitoring capability to close the loop? So if uh, someone's involved in a specific project, obviously you want to monitor it in order to determine if it's delivering as, uh, as promised. And if it turns out that for whatever reason, it's not delivering what was expected, what kind of remediation are you in a position to pursue? So um, right now we are finishing the, the first uh, prototype. Basically, we're building on top of Vera certifications. We're actually feeding the feeding the the algorithm from from Vera's data. Basically, what we do is we extrapolate from from that, and we kind of correlate the the data that we are uh, calculating uh, in your real time, so that we can kind of like maybe the auditors went to the project two two years ago. Uh, we can know what what is going now, uh, depending on the, on the last images, and also we can kind of double check. Uh, if our data uh, matches with, with what is in the certification in all the documents from, from Vera, um, we are still learning a lot from, from it. We're far from having a perfect model at the moment. Thank you very much, Lisa and Diego. I think we will need to move to the next solution as time is running out. So I would like to now turn to Trees for the Future and John Leary. John, over to you. Thank you so much. We at Trees for the Future are absolutely humbled to be in the finals of such a prestigious competition. What we have learned in planting nearly 200 million trees over the last 30 years directly speaks to the goals of the Trillion Trees Challenge. It is clear to us that if we plant a trillion trees without fixing the destructive nature of our food and farming systems and the impacts they're having on our ecosystems, then the planet will still be in peril. Uh, it is my honor to present today what we see as humanity's best strategy for feeding the future, achieving our sustainable development goals, and ending climate change. Six years ago, as we planted our hundred millionth tree, we gathered the best ideas from the previous 25 years in tree planting and gathered all the best ideas in centuries old indigenous practices, regenerative agroforestry and new permagardening techniques. And we created a four year training program called the Forest Garden Approach. And it was designed to be a pathway out of poverty and extreme hunger for millions of people around the world struggling. And today it's helping 19,000 families consisting of over 143,000 people. In the program, in the Forest Garden program, we provide the training, 
seeds and essential materials. And the farmers like more loom here provide the land, the labor, the water and an entrepreneurial spirit. In our training workshops, they learn to plant and grow about 4,000 seedlings dozens of vegetables, perennials, fruit trees, like the one he's next to right here, this cashew tree. Many of the first year trees are planted in the living fence, which is a, a, a thorny protective barrier that shields the family's investments from risks. It's oftentimes multi-road, more looms uh, was clean and nice and straight. And within the protection of these living fences, uh, families are able to grow the new paradigm in agriculture, forest gardens. Here, two years later, next to the same cashew seedling, you see he's with his wife and his child. The family has something to eat, sell, or trade every single month of the year. They have diverse portfolios of different types of fruit trees and nut-bearing trees. There's permagardens of vegetables, bushes, timber trees, growing together, all working with nature, not against it, producing more product with less effort each year. In the layers, there's habitat for birds, bats, bees. You can imagine what it meant for the Loom family's food security during this COVID crisis, having 180 different types of fruit trees to depend upon. Over nine million data points in our Salesforce database have proven a powerful triple bottom line of impacts. And most importantly, that the forest garden approach ends hunger for communities within two years by taking people from low dietary diversity to high dietary diversity and from being severely food insecure to reaching food security. The forest garden approach also increases the number of marketable crops that each family is growing. It increases the number of paydays and it can increase families income from 400% and as high as 1000% if families have access to running water. Imagine going from $1.25 a day to four or $5 a day and you can go to all the way to $10 a day if you have access to water. Um, if you look at the next slide, you'll see that We've done focus groups with youth, and we've learned that at about $75 a month, a young African 22-year-old would prefer to stay in the community earning $75 or $100 a month. We can double or even quadruple those expectations with forest gardens. And so you can see what a better investment this is than paying you know, the cost is $75,000 a year to, to host youth in migrant camps in Europe. And it's, uh, and then if you look at food aid costs as well, uh, the drones show the incredible environmental impacts. Forest gardens sequester 60 to 90 tons of carbon per hectare, and they truly regenerate the degraded land. This is just one year, year to year. And piece by piece, we believe that we can contribute to the mosaic that will be the great green wall across Africa by working with farmers to plant forest gardens. I'm gonna end by saying that everything grows better in a forest garden. The same agroforestry techniques that are improving Rose's life are also the secret for agribusinesses and the private sector to be regenerative in how they produce all of the commodities and foods that feed the world, horticulture, oil crops, coffee, cocoa, everything that's causing deforestation now can be grown in ways that are regenerative and we can show you how. Uh, we hope to lift a million people out of hunger and poverty by planting 125,000 forest gardens by 2025. We have attracted a wonderful team. We have a wonderful enthusiastic donors, public sector, private sector, social sector partners. Uh, we need large farmer networks that the World Economic Forum uh, actors may be sourcing from. We have the solution. We can start tomorrow. Um, and New Soms Ensemble, we're all together uh, and, and we can do this. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, questions from the panel. Hindu, yes, please, over to you. 
Thank you very much for the presentation. I see that you are working basically in African uh, countries. And uh, I also saw that from, uh, I mean, I'm not lying to all of you. I went through all your websites and then I saw what you what you did. So not only him. So I mm -hmm. saw that all your leadership are not coming from the Africa. You have tried some of the staff that only from Africa. And then uh, I really believe that people cannot be only beneficiaries. They can be partners. So how would you uh, do in this project that people to be partners in this project in them lands, not just the beneficiaries getting lessons from the expert? Sure. Um, we have about 200 employees across Africa, and all of them are, are African. Um, our, our American and international staff based out of Washington, D.C. here is help, happy to help in, in various ways. Uh, we're partnering directly with farmer groups. And through farmer groups, through women's groups, cooperatives and associations, that's how we can scale. Um, we're looking for more introductions to those types of groups. And we're, we're permanent partners with them. Uh, helping all of their members, not just plant forest gardens, but we've also been working with them on savings clubs and accessing markets uh, for all the horticultural crops and others. So, uh, you know, our farmer groups, I speak Wolof, I speak other languages, and, and we work directly with our farmer groups to help them kind of access new markets and, and really try to be a grassroots partner in, in that way. Thank you, John. Uh, Rod, I saw you had a question. Yes, thank you. You mentioned right at the start that one of the inputs from farmers is water. Could you clarify the kind of rain fed or other water sources that are necessary for the model? Sure, yeah, the model is flexible so that if everything's rain fed, then you pick species that do not you know, need constant irrigation throughout the year. The cashew tree was a great example. It's very hardy. Uh, it produces a very lush, juicy fruit in, in the dry season. Uh, vegetables are the same way. Some of the higher value horticulture requires a bit of water if you want to do tomatoes and other things. But if the family is limited, we can find squash and watermelon and other things that are more water friendly and arid friendly models. Uh, when you do get access to water, and we see a lot of our farmers doing it, we've had investors who put money into the water. It's a key leverage point. We, you, $5 a day is a huge win, but we can take people to $10 a day. Uh, we situate our programs around where other organizations have established water infrastructure, and we're helping to make that sustainable in, in many ways. Yeah. Thank you, John. We are now going to turn to our last finalist, David Ezra J from Greenstand. David, over to you. Hello. On behalf of the Greenstand community and technology and a data-driven model that is growing across continents. This model can pay a billion people to grow diverse forests. Greenstand is about the people growing trees. The large number of professionals who have been shaping this project are here for environmental and social reasons. I'm here because of the people I've met. And uh, earlier this year, I met this woman, Lucy. She's the leader of an indigenous women's group in East Africa and one of the few people with a smartphone in that village. And with Lucy's phone, the women in her group are doubling and tripling their income by growing and monitoring their trees. And these aren't just any trees. This is an African teak tree and it's an endangered tree. And it's one of a lot of trees that they have there. These women are growing, they're growing a diverse forest here. And this is forest is on the edge of a biodiversity hotspot. It's, it's a really amazing story to me. And, and what's most amazing is that, that they're doing it in a way that scales naturally and, and can scale massively. So here's how it works. Users are responsible for creating the impact on the ground and sending a digital proof of that impact. We have an open source technology stack that verifies what that impact actually is and who is responsible for it. This data package is then minted into a wallet on a central ledger, allowing users and third-party entities to own and trade it on an open marketplace for carbon, it can be traded for biodiversity or other ecosystem services. So it's really a, a data package or it's a, 
It's a forest product that turns the act of restoring our planet into profit. And the challenge that we have, it's, it's not one that you can solve from outer space or, or with drones. It's answering impact ownership. We're mapping an actual interaction between humans and the environment. So for our uh, data analysts, this is a, a complex problem. For our users, it's simple. Growers, click a photo. That's it. We've made it so simple to track trees that people don't have a reason not to. That the hard part is actually growing the trees and, and verifying that it's actually alive. That's, that's the easy part. If you have trees or your organization is planting trees, spend an extra three seconds to click a digital verification of your impact. And when you do, you're going to end up, uh, your trees end up here where we verify them and we can crowdsource or outsource the tagging of any, anything you can see in here. And that really builds this, this data package. And, and we can do that for as many trees as you can ever find. And these numbers are scaling. We are setting up to collect and process a massive amount of data surrounding the incremental growth of individual trees at a, at a global scale. So to do that, we need machine learning, autom automation, uh, image recognition. We can't really do it without it. And here you can see we've got uh, one of our awesome contributors is analyzing the leaf structure of a croton tree with um, image recognition. And, and these are processes that we're building. We have an open source community that is, is figuring out these problems. And, and we're doing it in a way that is, is open and that can be replicated and, and anyone can use. So, so how much does it cost? Well, what our users have found is that they can make money with this platform. This technology finances forests. It uses real data to make growing trees profitable for everyone. So in this model, the last mile is the marketplace. It starts with a farmer growing the tree. It ends with you being able to own, trade, and take credit for an unquestionable verified impact. That teak tree in Africa that Lucy helped track was funded by the sale of a cup of coffee in a restaurant in Singapore. This is a model that can pay a billion people to grow a trillion trees. If we adopt a standard, a green standard is simple. Green stand answers, who owns what impact? Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I would like now to turn to our judges and maybe Bruno, would you like to ask the first question given your, given your um, expertise in the AI area? Yeah, I, I was thinking of why this uh, blockchain technology, as I understand you're using, and, and then the, the steps where you have to cluster together a lot of trees to create, uh, or the harvest to go make the beans and then, then connect that to the coffee. How do you how do you how do you ensure that trust in the community translates to trust in the in the system, and at the same time with the steps where there is this clustering and then this aggregation of the products as it moves to the production line. So, basically, what we do is we we capture a tree, and and that is a, a data package and. And so we can put that in a central ledger where you can transfer and move it. So it's very hard to falsify the system or to, to uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to put something there that you can't see. It's a very visual product. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, okay, that, that's, that's good. And uh, how big is the operation now? How much, how much have you grown? How, how many trees and how much value have you transacted through the system? So it's, it's starting to scale quite a lot. We've got uh, just, I think in the semifinals, we had three different organizations here that have started using us and are adopting it. So um, yeah, so it's, it's starting to scale. And um, there's kind of two different models behind it. One is that organizations are using the platform to verify what they're doing. And 
Um, they can show their trees and be like, oh yeah, we've, we've taken your money, here are your trees. And the other is this model that is really paying people to grow forests, which is, is the real goal. That's, that is the powerful model is when you can start paying people to actually grow forests. Thank, Thank you, you very much, David. And we have come to the end of our session. So I will have to close the, the judging panel here, uh, even though there's lots more to discuss. As you've seen, we've had solutions, uh, some of which are very much at a startup scale, others that are already scaling, others that have years of experience in terms of, um, you know, prototyping a certain model. And, and intentionally, um, the intention of the challenge was to identify and source a whole variety of different solutions that are at different different um, stages. I would like to thank all of the finalists, uh, but most importantly, all of the people who have submitted their solutions and who are working tirelessly to restore our balance with the natural world and to bring back our forests and protect uh, the forests that we still have. A warm thanks to you because your work is so important. Thank you also to our judges who will now go on and deliberate and select the three winners who will be announced on September 24th at 2 p.m. CET at the closing session of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit. And we encourage all of you to vote for the People's Choice Award via Slido, share the link so other people can watch the live stream and also vote for their choice who will be announced at the same time on the 24th. Thank you very much. Goodbye.